So, uh, so I'll show you this session. What we were learning was to consider like a linear regression and distribution name things. <clears throat> the ideas behind those models was that you know, there are some optimal answer that you can find by either taking some sort of derivation or by simply calculating prob the probability like the prior values like the name is right and uh, especially when we are looking at uh logistic regression as an example talk about the classification uh or any sort of discriminative models that we have uh UB, what all we needed was that to apply some maximum likelihood distribution to get duration set to zero and supply find it out, right? And the reason uh, we can solve the problems in that way is that because they are convex problems. Now, not always we are dealing with convex problems that are simple like that, that you can take a duration and set it to zero. Okay. Uh, so we are going to, uh, we're going to learn a new concept called convex optimization. Uh, before we start to give you just some uh, brief, uh, description of what's convex optimization, because you might say that, oh, we already had done convex, so what was that? That's also a still convex optimization, but the difference here is that uh, in scenarios that we have seen, we always only dealt with a convex function. There was a function which was convex. And because, because of the shape of a convex function has a minimum point that you take a derivation to zero, right? So if we remember convex function, we say that basically the function is convex that the following Um, you say any function that the following holds, you know, it's convex. That's one way of proving it. The second way was that we said if you take a second derivation of the function with respect to a vector and it proves that it's positive, so indefinite, right? That all means it's convex within that. You see the shape, shape of the convex was like this, basically. There's a minimum point here that means that if the deviation is going to be less than zero, that the division is zero. Right? And that definition is here. Any if you connect any two points, any value between those points always is below. So this was convex function, right? And any function that so far we dealt with had this. Property it was convex function you can take a derivation series. Now there is another concept that we want to first talk before we get to this. It's called convex set. Actually, before we go to convex set, let me give you two examples. You guys have an exam. Let's say um, I give you the following. And you are told that okay, you have this function and you want to prove this is convex. And um, I will tell you that, for example, prove using the first scenario, this is convex. What, what's the step that you will take if you, you need to use the triangle or inequality? Mm -hmm. Is that no, no, I exactly use that one, that one, the triangle or inequality. What's because we don't because we have to we have an alpha also here. Yeah. So, so let's let's say you have some alpha, right? Let's say we have some alpha, some a scalar which is between or a real number. Did you say I put the same said like it could be like alpha without x or uh, uh, like x one plus one minus alpha y or x two. So you say you just replace them, right? So you basically will say that f of alpha x plus one minus alpha y, right? So you want to prove this is less than equal to f of x plus one minus alpha 
of work, right? So the next step you do is something add an alpha here, right? So basically we know this is going to be alpha of x into plus homogeneous alpha, right? If I would just simplify that term. Uh, this will uh, go out. Uh, uh, square root of. No, but how, if, if we multiply a scalar by a real number, how would you bring the real number out? Common. Alpha or absolute value. Absolute value, right? Okay. We already know alpha is between zero and one, that means it's always positive, it just becomes. Right? If, if the question tells you that to prove it in triangular in one, you need to simply substitute whatever you have using some x and y, and to prove that you can reach the disturbance. So basically, using the properties of Right. You first write it in this form, then use the properties of norm to simplify this. Now, let's say I will give you this one. Let's say you do the other way around y minus ax, or x minus y actually. That should also give you the same thing. And I'm telling you that using the second problem. But in a scenario like that, you know, we first thing is that to simplify this, right? Apply that into multiplication. You know, technically, these two are the same. So. <clears throat> Now, what all you need to do is to take two derivation of this term right, with respect to x. First, first one is if this term goes, but when it comes out, so the first derivation will give you um, a trans minus a transpose y, and what it gives you uh, a transpose a x, the two and one of which cancel. You take a second derivation, basically, gives you a transpose. And A transpose A is always greater than zero. Always greater than equal zero. Always positive semi dependent. A matrix times itself is always positive semi. Because it's square, it's basically a dot product. So. Because if, if you multiply a matrix by itself, it becomes a uh, basically a dot product between each. Rows and each column, right? So if you have a negative, negative times negative becomes always positive. If it's positive, it stays positive. So it's always positive semi dependent. So okay, that, that, that's convex function. Okay. And perhaps seen this before. Now And we want to talk about convex set. What's the definition of a set? Set of points, right? So we will say that S 
um, or let's call it um, set S is convex if and only if um, for any basically alpha the following and for and um, so basically any x and y belonging to that set f alpha x plus one minus alpha y is also part of the set okay. so we are basically saying that the set is convex that if you pick any two points from that set and connect them with a the line together this is the equation of the line right any point that falls on on that line should be also part of that set okay so any two points within a set connect them with the line together any point on that line should be part of that set if you have such a set it's, it's called a convex set now think about it this way so i have this one this is a set right any two points you pick within this set is another one here on the line one here and if you connect them together these points on the line also is part of the set this is considering that this is all of that is your set you know but if you had something like this it's shaded anyway it's your set now this is not a convex set because again if i pick this two this part is not part of your set now let's write a couple of examples um we'll say set s um let's say we have this following set one and we want to say that if this is uh is the convex set or not so what's the shape of that set Circle. Now, is this a convex set? Could you pick any two points within this set and connect them together and say that it's always belongs to the set? Could you? No. What do you mean? Does it, no. it says it's equal to one. Equal means the surface, right? Any point on this line is equal to one. Nothing inside. So if I pick this two point, that doesn't satisfy the property. It's not part of the set, right? If I pick this two point, which belongs to the set, and I connect them together, these points, they don't belong to the set. This is not a convex set. So, let's say how about this one now? Now it's convex because this is the region including the basically surface now any two points you connect to each other the, all the points on that line also belongs to this set so this is a convex set now actually How about this? So this is your set. However, if I pick these two points, this part is not part of your set. 
It's not also a convex. So, so here uh, you can always make an assumption, uh, like assume that any time there is less than equal by default is convex. Okay. Any time um, is equal in a norm form, it's not convex. Greater than equal or norm is not convex. Okay. Now. How about this? Converse. What's what's the equation? A line, right? Right. If this is a line, doesn't matter which point on the line you uh, you connect them together is still on the line. So line is always convex. Okay. Now, how about this? Right. What does that tell you? That there is a line, anything below the line, including the line, right? Any two points you pick here is always a still point of that set. Even if it's greater than you hold the line, above the line, is a still unmixed. Okay. So you are always going to deal with one of these five scenarios. Equal, less than equal in a function, yes. Explain the last one again. Like so, so AX less than equal B. Which area it discovers this area, including the line? That's your set. Now, any two point you pick here, you connect them together, that line is still part of your set. Right? So basically, it includes the whole area below the line. Anything below, including the line, below the line, anything from this region is part of your set. So, you pick. Any two points within that region connect them. Look, your line is still really inside that set. Right? So, does that, does that make sense? So, it's always one of these five scenarios. It's going to be equal, it's going to be some sort of, you know, if it's norm version, it's equal, greater than equal, less than equal. If it was less than equal, it's always convex. If it's greater than equal, it's, there's a chance to have a convex set. We will see some scenarios, but majority of them is not convex. If it's equal, it's not convex for now. Then the other scenario it goes to the line. Line by default is always convex. Less than equal, greater than equal is also convex. So now. Uh, what would it look like when we have greater than equal to, but it is convex? Uh, I think we will have some examples coming up. Just bear with me. So now you will say uh, S one is a convex set. S two is a convex set. Okay. Given. Given. This one is a convex set. S2 is a convex set. S1 basically intersect intersection S2 is always convex. Okay. So always convex. S1 union S2 could be convex, could be not convex. And I'm going to see the how. For the first one, when if this is S1. And this is S2, right? The intersect, this section, is always convex. But think about the union, right? Now, if I pick this two point, this part is not part of the set. So this, this is not a convex set anymore, right? 
Now let's look at the example that union could be convex. Let's say I have a set that looks like this. This one. And then this two. The union is also convex. So for uh, intersection, you can by default always assume that it's convex. But when you're dealing with union, you need to actually verify. Could be convex. So the majority of them is not convex union, but you know they have scenarios like this could happen. Does this make sense so far? Now, something to keep in mind is that all these functions that we, all these sets that we wrote is question. Oh, you know, no. <laughs> right. So all these uh, sets that we wrote, they are vector form. Okay, these are not for matrices. Remember, so. We're going to write and talk about matrices, but everything that we wrote is in a vector form. Okay, so now let's say we have we have the following. Um, we are saying that this set A X less than equal B. Um, Point AX less than equal B. We want to see that if it's convex or not. Now, A is a matrix. Okay, it's M by N. Let's say X is N by one. So this is M by one. So you have such a multiplication a matrix times a vector less than equal another vector, right? And you want to see that if it's convex set or not. So Whenever you are dealing with matrices in convex sets, the best way to prove it is to break it down into vectors and use one of those five scenarios to prove if it's convex or not. Now, the first thing we're going to do is that looking at this term, so we can write this in a matrix form, right? Matrix vector form. Look, so A is a matrix, so let's write it as a A1 transpose. A M transpose times X, X is one vector, this then equal B is a basically vector B1 to B M values, correct? Yeah, here we can write that one in this one. So now this technically also means A1 transpose. Uh, A1 transpose X all the way to AM transpose X less than equal E1 to yeah. Does that make sense so far? Uh, which one which one of those properties that we, we learned so far would you use to prove this is convex? That's for one of them, right? How would you pr prove it? For all of them. So for one of them, we already know this is always convex, right? For individual. But how would you prove it for all of them to be a deck to be a convex? Yeah. That's the still for one, that's for vector. The intersection as all of them. Yeah. This and this and this and this, because this intersection is going to be convex, right? So we will say that A1 transpose X less than equal B and A2 transpose X less than equal B1 to all the way. And transpose X less than equal B. So we write this as and, 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 because this one is convex, this one is convex, all of them is convex, and it's intersection and it's basically and, so it's total is convex. Does that make sense? Anyone feel like that doesn't make sense? So, which part do you want me to go over? Just the last part. So do you, do you agree up to this point? 
So we are saying that we want to prove this total is convex, right? We already know that each individual is convex. Correct? If I have this equation, I can write this as A1 transpose X less than equal B1 and A2 transpose X less than equal B2 and, correct? So we already know based on the convex set properties, intersection of convex sets is also convex. So this one, we already know is convex set, right? This one also we know is a convex set. So, so because it's intersection, right? Is it like an and? Anytime there's an and between convex sets, becomes convex sets. Right? So basically what you want to do is that anytime you deal with matrices, break it down into vector form, use those five properties, it's always one of those five concepts, and then use the and or basically the union, right? You would be able to prove if it's convex or not. Does that make sense? Three, every individual row is supposed to give us make a set of points. One e x less than equal to b. That condition of the convex it is supposed to give us like a set of points, right? So, so this this no. So this one a a one transpose x less than equal less than equal b one, right? That's it. So by default, this is one. This is going to give you one point, right? This is the inner product. So when we say that is convex, uh, we are trying to prove like. That then there will be like a set of points, right? So You're right, right. So this is what we are trying to do. This point is part of the set. This point is part of the set. This point, the set of all these points together is part of your set. That's right. what we are trying to do. Make sense? This this one it gives you one point, right? We said this point is convex. That means it's part of the set still. If you prove each individual of this is still part of the set, so because it's and the total. Is part of the set. Make sense? Anyone feel like you like oh, I don't know what's happening? This question. Yeah. Now this gonna give like points or lines, like for example, let's 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 draw that actually. So that's exactly the same thing here. First one, A1 transpose. X less than equal B1. That's the first line, correct? Throw the second one. A2 transpose X less than equal B2. Throw the third one. A1, A3 transpose X less than equal B3. When you put all these lines on top of each other, they will find some enclosed area because it's N, which is convex. That area is set of points, right? Which are the individual, right? So now, why we are learning this, like why we are learning convex set and why we are learning uh, uh, going over convex function again. And the reason is that we want to go over convex optimization. Now, convex optimization, the definition is that uh, you, um, we want to basically, basically we have a function f of x. Let's say f of x is a convex function, okay, where it has some constraints which are convex. What does that mean? So we have a function, let's say we, we, we are trying to, because this problem is minimization, we are trying to minimize some with respect to x. That's so far everything we have seen before in the class. A function we wanted to minimize, convex function. As soon as, so if you only have that, you just need to take a derivation, set it to zero, that's a convex function. As soon as you see an equation, Objective function has a term subjected to. You no longer can solve that using maximum likelihood distribution. And we're going to talk about why. So convex function say, convex optimization say, if you have a convex function which has some constraints, and the constraints are h i x, for example, or it's just like 
less than uh, hijx written uh, equal to zero and gjx less than equal zero for i from one to twenty for j from one to twenty. Don't get uh, distracted by the equations. We're going to go over those. But as soon as you have a function which is constrained by two sets, or maybe maybe more than two sets, doesn't necessarily need to be two, one or two or hundred sets, which each of these set is convex set, your problem becomes the convex optimization. Right? So we already know how to prove a function is convex. Because if someone gives you something like this, you, it, it, that doesn't mean that by default it's convex. You need to first prove for the function is the convex function, which we already saw there are two ways. Triangular inequality, second derivation if it's positive, somewhere different. You prove this is a convex function. And we already saw all the five properties here that a set becomes a convex set. So then you prove if this is a convex set, if this is also a convex set, and look at the rest of them, or they are convex set, this becomes a convex optimization problem. Now, why uh, why we cannot solve this using maximum likelihood estimation? The, the, the reason is that maximum likelihood estimation is a still you can apply it to this, you know, you can just take a derivation of this set to zero, find the x. What will happen here is that the solution that maximum likelihood estimation gives you will violate one of the constraints. Because maximum likelihood estimation only gives you the answer for this. It doesn't seize these terms. There's no guarantee that you will satisfy the constraints. Majority of them actually you are violating all of them. So that's why. As soon as you have constraints, MLE doesn't work anymore. Okay, because MLE technically doesn't seize the term. It just sees the objective function. Does that, does that make sense? So, just guys, be sure that this class is really important because everything so far, what we have learned, like maximum likelihood submission stuff, we used it for those techniques that we were learning linear regression, uh, the justifications. Whatever you learn in this class is going to be for the next four or five algorithms that we're going to learn. So this is what we are going to constantly use. If you feel like a part of it doesn't make sense, you want me to go over it again, just uh, raise your hand. So, now, how, how would we solve for this? Like, well, so okay, we have this, we know this is a convex optimization. What's the next step? So there is a technique called Lagrangian solver, Lagrangian optimization. So Lagrangian solver is really similar to some of the techniques we have seen before, like similar, like a, not from the uh, onset perspective, but it's really, it's really similar to regularization. It has some penalty term concept. Now, Lagrangian says that in order to solve for this, we want to get rid of these terms. How should we get rid of those? By bringing them and adding them to the objective function. So like removing them from the constraints and bringing them into your objective function. Then you will have one objective function, which is a combination of this and this and this. And then you can basically take a derivation of that. So Lagrangian always starts with the term L, it stands for Lagrangian. So there's a parenthesis. First thing here is that, okay, you always, the first variables that you write inside the parameters are the original variables that you're solving. Here, what's the original variable? X is the original unknown. For example, it could be theta, it could be W, whatever. So you always first write X, because here X is just one dimension. Like if it was a vector, I would have been writing this way, x as a vector. Like if you have a theta, theta has d dimension, I would write theta as a vector, right? So here is just x. I'm just solving for x, comma. Now, this Lagrangian solver technique 
the way that it works. In order for us to be able to bring these terms out of constraints and add them to the objective function, we are going to do. Um, let's, let's start with let's start with for the, for the moment. Let's assume you have one of these. In order to make it complete, I will start with one constraint, then I go to two constraints. Let's just start. We have one constraint, equality constraint. In, the, in order to bring this up, you are going to um, first uh, we have x, right? X has its associated function. So write this here, f of x. So so far nothing has changed, right? The original objective function. Now think about it. This term, this function is minimization, right? We want to bring this up, put it here. Lagrangian, it will add it there. Okay. Why do you think adding? Why we are not subtracting if it's minimization? Simple minimization and using it as penalty. So it's similar to the concept of penalty. If you're adding it, you're forcing it to go to zero because we want to minimize. If you're subtracting it, it's going to get a large value because it always gives you a smaller range. So let, let me write it. So we, we will write f of x plus something. What is that plus something? So here, how many constraints do you see in this equation? So that's the constraint. This is says for i from one to n. How many constraints do you have? No. N. This is this constraint is repeating n times, right? So first you have n constraints. So it will add the following term, summation over all these constraints, okay, h i x. Now, there is a, a parameter that Lagrangian has, and we call it Lagrangian multiplier, okay? If it's equality, we are going to use the term alpha, alpha. So anytime you have an equality constraint, use alpha. Now, how many we have? How many constraints we have? N. You are going. To, you need to learn n multipliers, alpha one through alpha n. Those are the parameters belonging to the Lagrangian Lagrangian multiplier. Now, those parameters technically just being multiplied directly by the corresponding constraint. So, in order to bring this term up. Lagrangian bring this up like a penalty term, add it to the objective function, but you cannot simply bring it up. It's actually, we learn a parameter also for it, an alpha, it's called Lagrangian multipliers. So this becomes f of x plus summation of this times this. This is i from one to n. So this is called Lagrangian solver. Does, does this make sense? Look at it again. We, we try to minimize this. We say that if we simply minimize this, we will violate this because we don't see that. How could we see that? Bring it up, add it to the objective function. So rather than having a constraint, now we have only one equation. But how could we bring it up? So I am trying to minimize this term. If I simply bring these terms off and I don't know what's the sign, if the sign was negative, look what will happen. And because I'm trying to minimize it, right? This minus something, whoa, it's getting smaller, right? So this constraint becomes important. Your model will try to learn those, correct? But if I make it positive, because I try to minimize, now I'm adding something to it. What do you think the model will do? Force this to go to zero. Right? Similar to the regularization concept, because we are adding something to the minimization. Now the model forces this goes to zero. By forcing this to go to zero, it's disappeared. You don't have constraints anymore. You're going to just minimize that back to the. See, it's kind of like it's a trick. We're tricking it by bringing this up and then forcing it to go to zero. That Lagrange multipliers, the reason we have them is to. They will help us to force this to go to zero. 
can you please give an example because i'm really confused like if we are bringing that up how will it go to zero like we didn't i know we did regularization also but i always get confused like how exactly we are adding terms here why will it go to zero then so this one by default is zero already look at the definition hix is always zero doesn't matter what's alpha thousand that summation is always zero with that one right you will see for the second constraints the scenario is different this one by default is always zero. doesn't matter what alpha model be that summation is always zero so we already solved it that if if that is always zero lagrangian equal to f of x even if we take alpha is thousand so thousand it's exactly like into zero is zero. but there's a caveat so we, we're going to get to that if, what if this is not zero? What if you violate a constraint and this is not zero? Then even if one of them is not zero, that one is going to get such a large alpha. Right? So we, we will get to that part. Now, does this so far make sense? Yes? Okay, so now we have that term. Okay. We, what we want to do is we want to take the derivation of this with respect to x. We're solving for x. And alpha star is essentially zero. Once take a derivation with respect to this alpha i, where x x was one alpha, you have individual alpha. You need to take derivation with respect to each alpha. So take a derivation with respect to x because we already don't, we don't know what are the functions, but this is basically is going to be derivation of this plus derivation alpha i. Derivation of h i x over x. It's just derivations. You know, we don't know the function, and we set that to zero, okay. and that gives basically solve for x. For for alpha i, what's the derivation of that term with respect to alpha i? For one and for two, like we will derive for alpha i. Charlie. H, H, I, 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 and H I only. Because if I imagine I have this term 3x1 plus 5x2 plus 3x3 plus 1. Deviation with respect to x1 is always 3. When you say deviation with respect to H I, it will be the rest of them are will go to zero, right? So this is always H I X set to zero, which we reach to the same thing again, right? Does that make sense? So basically what, what we are seeing is that HIX is always zero, doesn't matter what alpha you pick, you know, that term is always going to zero. Now, let's give one example. Okay. Let's say we have the following, and we want to basically solve it. Basically, the goal is that to find the optimal x. Okay. Now, remember the steps. Similar to maximum likelihood, when we were saying that there are steps that you need to take, here you need to also remember the steps. You don't you can't just jump into solving. You need to prove this is a convex function, and you need to prove this is a convex set. Then you can solve it using convex optimization. Okay. Now, because we all, for the class perspective, I know this is all the convex is known to wrote so many times. Equation of the line, we also say that it's a convex. So this is two together is convex. So if it's convex, I know I can use Lagrangian to solve this, right? So I will write Lagrangian. What's the original variable x? Now, what? What parameter would you use? How many constraints you have? This time is only one. That's it. If you have any indices, then you have that many constraints. If there's no indices, it's only one. So we are only learning one alpha. Okay. Now, 
equational objective function plus, and this is the part that we need to pass. Could you use this? What was the definition of the constraints that we have? Equal to zero, less than equal to zero. But that's the truth. You remember in MLE, we always try to simplify the function before we go for derivation. Here, it's possible the sets that you get are, at the beginning, they don't look like convex. So you need to manipulate them to become a convex, right? This is like a straightforward, but we already can say that A transpose X minus B equals to zero. It should be always equal to zero, less than equal to zero, one of these two, okay? So then uh, we don't have summation because we don't have indices over there. So it's going to be alpha times a transpose x minus b. That becomes your Lagrangian term, right? Now, okay, what's the next step? We want to solve one second derivation with respect to x, one second derivation with respect to alpha. So, So, because we are solving for optimal, this alpha and this x, they're getting star value. Uh, I will say that x star basically is equal to minus alpha star. Okay. Now, take a derivation with respect to alpha. Zero. Um, a transpose x minus b equal to zero. We already have this is an x star that we're solving for. We already have the x star, so we replace it here, right? So this becomes a transpose minus alpha a minus b equal to zero. Well, norm two of a equal b minus b make sense. We take a derivation with respect to x set it to zero. We wrote in this form x equal alpha times that, right? Why did we put the star there? So, because we are solving for the optimal answer. Okay. That's your optimal answer. For each scenario, whatever you find, it's assumption is that that's your optimal answer, right? Then you take a derivation with respect to alpha, and then you reach this term. We already have an x star, so we replace it. This should be star. And then a transpose a because its vector is become norm two of a, right? Norm two to the power of two equal b. So alpha becomes minus b over. Okay. So what happens to it? One by two. Okay. So norm two. You wish with respect to x. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So x transpose x becomes two x, right? When one over two they cancel. Now, we have alpha star, put it back here in X. So X star now becomes B A right. So that becomes your X star. So for the first line, so X star should be equal to my transpose. No, because alpha is a scalar. No, I mean a. a so when you take when you take a derivation with respect to x, the transpose doesn't need to be there anymore, right? You had the transpose, so you are able to multiply these two together, right? So that if x is not there, alpha times a transpose or alpha times a, they are the same thing, right? So, okay. 
Okay, now this is your alpha. This is your X. Now, the short answer is that after you solve Lagrangian, Lagrangian uh, or matrix optimization, you need to validate your answer. Okay, and this means that you need to be able to replace these two into your original objective function and your constraints, and this should satisfy the constraint. Okay, that's a short answer. So let's try it. So we replace this here. It's going to be minimization over one over two, and for x we have that term to the power of two, basically, that becomes b two norm two norm two to the power of four, which this and this you no know, they can cancel. So this technically cancelled with power of two here. So this becomes minimization um, of one over two b two. A two and two. That's your objective function. So we replace whatever x we found here because this is to the power of two. B gets to the power of two. A is a vector. The power of two becomes norm two. Norm two to the power of two, which we already had. The power of two becomes to the power of four. So power that power of four cancels out with this power of two. So what remains is the power of two. Now look at for the constraints. A transpose x minus b equal to zero. Let's replace A transpose x. So if I multiply A transpose times b over A2 times A minus b should be zero, right? So A transpose A becomes norm two. These two cancel this. B minus b equal zero, right? So the this b minus b equal to zero. That means that the answer that you found satisfy the constraints, right? Makes sense. So you, this is your constraint. Replace x here. This becomes exactly b equal b or b minus b equal to zero. That means you satisfy the constraint. Example of the, the something that it doesn't satisfy the constraint. You would have solved b then becomes b equal to b, b equal to b plus something. That means that the answer you have didn't satisfy the constraint. Make sense? Which part of here is confusing? If you use that when you were validating, you don't use alpha. Just the x. Because you don't have alpha in no. the objective in the original function. You after you solve, you replace whatever you have back into the original form. Alpha is only, you only solve alpha because using alpha, you can find the X. After that, alpha doesn't have any use for you. Okay. That makes sense? Okay, now. Now let's go to a scenario that we have two constraints. Okay. So we are trying to minimize f of x or x subjected to, and again, this is assumption, this is a, con, a, con, a convex function subjected to h i h equal zero and g j x less than equal zero for i from one and for j from one to n. One to n and one to m, they don't necessarily need to be different. They could be both one to n. Okay. It's just a general form. Now, same story applies here. If you have one constraint or you have a series of equality and inequality, the Lagrangian will bring these two, add them to the original objective function. So we have. The original function, the original variable is x. Then for h i x, we already saw we're going to use alphas. So it's going to be alpha one through alpha n. Now, anytime you have, um, for example, in this class, we 
have inequality, which is beta. Okay. So that you know that's just in order to be on the same page. Otherwise, it doesn't matter what you, what term you use. You know. So I think in your book actually they use beta and alpha the other way around. So, um, and also remember, if you have more than one equality, you shouldn't use the same term. You should change it. You, you, you need to introduce a new variable. So this becomes f of x plus summation of alpha i h i x plus summation of uh, beta j g j x. Okay. And if you have more, it's going to be plus summation of all of those things. And the, here, there is two things. Alpha i is always real number. Beta j should be always greater than equal zero. Okay. Remember those two. That's based on the definition. Okay. The alpha is always a real number. Beta is always greater than equal to zero. Why is that? Why do you think alpha is should be a real number? It doesn't matter. Right? A real number basically means it doesn't matter whatever you mean. Because h i x is always zero. But for beta, why we say beta should be greater than zero? Because if you go minus, uh, maybe, maybe minus. No, beta is the beta is the scalar. Because the inequality is less than zero. Because this is always already less than zero. This is negative. <laughs> yeah, you want it to be positive term and negative term. And we will see what's the impact of that. Now, that's the equation, right? So now let's look at here what's happening. Lagrangian overall, we apply over a minimization function, right? So we have, let me rephrase. We do apply Lagrangian over maximization. It just changed the sign. If you were having a maximization, this becomes minus minus. If it's minimization, it's always add. If it's maximization, it's subtract. Okay. Now think about it. The original function with respect to x is minimization. Right? Lagrangian, now it has an x, which is the original variable. Now it has the Lagrangian multipliers. Do you think? We minimize with respect to Lagrangian multipliers or we maximize with respect to We maximize, right? Because we're adding those. So Lagrangian is minimizing with respect to X, maximizing with respect to alpha and beta because it adds alpha and beta, right? So this problem calls maximization. So Lagrangian is a maximization in this scenario. If it was reversed, but that means that I had something like this. Maximization of f of x subjected to whatever, whatever, then my Lagrangian becomes f of x minus minus. <laughs> then if my Lagrangian in that scenario became a minimization, right? So now, so this is a maximization with respect to what? With respect to alpha and beta's vector. So Lagrangian with respect to alpha and beta is a maximization. Now, we want to go over this. You're trying to maximize this term with respect to alpha and beta, and same time minimize it with respect to x, okay? If we're just looking at the maximization part, three scenarios are going to happen, always. First scenario is that, your maximization term, that means that term, okay, becomes infinite if there exists any equality constraints that is not equal to zero. That means if you violate one of the equality constraints, this term goes to infinite. Okay. This term is this one. Think about it. You are, to, if you are trying to maximize this, right? By default, we knew this hix is always zero. So alpha doesn't matter what alpha you pick. 
But if one of HIX is even zero point something, it's not zero, because your model tried to maximize, it picks such a large alpha for that, takes it to infinite. Because the model says, oh, my goal is to maximize this step, right? If one of them is not zero, this goes to infinite. Does that make sense? Yes. So this Lagrangian maximization part is maximization of this term. Right? So HIX by default should be equal to zero. If HIX is zero, doesn't matter what alpha you pick, this summation is always zero, this part, correct? But let's assume your, one of your HIX, but H1X is equal to two now. The rest of them are zero. So your model doesn't have any constraints on alpha. Alpha could be a real number. It's a real number, right? And its goal is to maximize this term. So what do you think the model will do? It would pick such a large alpha, like alpha equal, I don't know, whatever, I mean, to maximize that term, right? So that term goes to, the maximization goes to infinity. So that means if you violate any of the equality constraints. So can, like, can you explain again why we are taking the BJ greater than zero? Right? I'm going go to go there now. Yeah. So now the second scenario, we, we still could get the infinite if there exists a GJX that is not less than or equal to zero. Now, your goal is to basically maximize this, minimize that, right? If, and you know, JJX is always negative, correct? If your BJX is also becomes a negative term, right? Now, if this was other negative, so then this total became a positive term, right? then your model also needed to force all your BJs to, to be zero. Right? Then, the, then your answer is always zero. Right? However, if your BJ, beta J, sorry, beta J is quite positive, this term becomes a negative. Now, your model here is going to learn something. See, it cannot just, it cannot just force um, just randomly force them to go to zero. We, we, we're going to break it down. It will learn something. Some of the pages are going to be zero. Some of them are going to be greater than zero. You know, if that was also a negative, then there was no solution. This always goes to zero, or something, right? And we will see that in whole convex Magnetic regime uh, or the convex optimization, this term is where you get all the solution that page. and that's the reason we are forcing it to be positive. Okay. But it will try to be very small so that it the answer doesn't go to full negative because it wants to maximize it. Exactly. We're going to break it down right now. But if we force page A to be less than zero, then all of that goes to zero. You're not solving anything. You still need to find something. You know, it's not like that we just brought this up, you know, to say that it's uh, there's no answer. You know, we want to bring these terms up, get rid of them, but also we want to learn some parameters for our model. And beta is the parameter that we're going to look for. Okay. Alpha doesn't matter what you learn because alpha is always goes to zero. HIX is always zero. E of J, doesn't it go to zero? J of X is negative and we want to minimize it. We want to maximize it. Okay, it says greater than equal. And this one says less than equal. How many combinations you can find here? combination right we're going to write down this combination bj is that's that's what i'm saying that the rest of it the alpha j is not a solution it's just always zero beta j is the point actually you're going to find your optimal answers from because there are four combinations that can happen okay, let, let's just bear with me now so if this is not if there is one that is not less than zero this goes to infinite why if this was a positive term, that means basically, and that's become again a large value, and your model wanted to maximize. Now, to, to, to your answer, think about it. Your goal is to maximize, right? Lagrangian is goal is maximize, right? All together to maximize. 
if you think about beta, we, in which scenario would you get a large value? If your beta was negative, negative time negative always positive. So you model maximize this as much as it's good. By forcing beta to be positive, this term is always negative. So what do you think the model the Lagrangian will do? To force this to go to zero. Lagrangian tries to make this combination large, right? This one only goes large if HIX, one HIX is not zero, right? If all of them are satisfied, this term is always zero, correct? Now your Lagrangian is left with this term. This term, if beta is always positive, this is the summation of some negative terms, correct? So this is summation of negative, negative minus minus minus. So the Lagrangian doesn't like that. The Lagrangian rather is to have a zero than negative. So how would it do that? If force this term to go to, if your beta was a, a negative, this becomes positive, 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 then Lagrangian would have picked such a large value. Answer your question. Now, why does it take in the beta j value is always less than zero? Uh, we just said that if, if it's less than zero, this becomes plus plus. Beta j times j j j j x is a negative. Yes. Times another negative becomes positive, right? Yeah. Now, the third scenario, it tells you this term Lagrangian, which is that term, the total is Lagrangian equal f of x exactly if and only if for all i h i x is zero for all j g j x is less than equal here so the lagrangian term will be exactly equal to f of x if you satisfy all your constraints. Because if you satisfy all your constraints, that is zero by default, correct? How about the second one? The second one is not zero by default. What the model does, it forces to go to zero. So the optimization that this Lagrangian has is around the last one, to force the last term to go to zero. Because the first thing that we just went to alpha, if you satisfy all constraints, it's always zero itself, right? The one which is not zero by default is this. So you allow the model to force that to go to zero. Does that make sense? Everyone on this page, will, I go over it again. But if the second constraint is not, um, if it is violated, then it would become infinity, right? right. According to if, if you violate any constraints, then your answer is not optimal, basically. So in order, basically, it tells you that in order to solve this problem, write it in a Lagrangian form, bringing these terms up, add them to this minimization. Then, if you, if, then it tells you that if you satisfy both constraints, that term, this term, technically equal to this term, because this is zero, and we are going to force this to go to zero. Okay, so for the third scenario, HIX is always zero. So we, we force beta J GJX to go to zero. So in for the third scenario, we need to force this to happen. It doesn't happen by default. Questions? What about x? Like when we are talking about the maximization, we are talking about alpha and beta. Okay, just gonna, just, I'm going to exactly write that. Okay. So now, what we wrote was the maximization part of the equation to maximize with respect to alpha and beta. But we still have minimization. But what will happen to the x? So the technique basically says that you are trying to minimize with respect to X, same time, maximize with respect to alpha and beta. Anytime you have like this, minimize, maximization, maximize, minimization, solve one of them first, 
we solve, for example, this one, find the optimal alpha and betas, we place it back into this equation, right? And then minimize that equation. So here we already proved that if this is max, this is optimized, this part, that means alphas are basically this term goes to zero, this term goes to zero, right? So the output of this exactly become minimization of f of x with respect to x. Because again, okay, maximization of L, if everything is satisfied, is equal to f of x. Right? So this term equal to f of x. So this becomes minimization of f of x now. Now you don't have the constraints anymore. You just simply take a derivation, set it to zero. Does that make sense? Everyone? This will only happen if you satisfy, yes, we'll satisfy that. If you don't satisfy, then you don't have an answer. Because this goes to infinite. The maximization goes to infinite, then you don't have a minimization problem. So in order to be able to solve that, you need to satisfy the constraints and you need to force this term to go to zero. You need to force that to go to zero. And we're going to write down the combination that here could happen. There are steps to it. Now, now there is a, uh, there, there, there is a uh, basically point here, which says that if HIX basically equals zero is a hyper, hyper plane, that means multi-dimension, then, Minimization of minimization maximization of L is the same as maximization minimization of L. The order basically doesn't matter. If you are in higher dimension, the order doesn't matter. You can first minimize with respect to X, replace the optimal X into the equation, then maximize it with respect to alpha and beta. Both of these approaches gives you the same answer. However, we are going to later learn that this one is cheaper. Maximize minimization rather than minimize maximization. We will, we will get to that part later. We will find out that is cheaper. So now. So after we solve that minimization, maximization, the, uh, you always need to like check that if your solution is correct, if it's a solution satisfying the problem. Previously, I wrote here that you just basically replace the values, and I say that that's a simple scenario. That's not actually the, the case. The case is that you, are need, you, you do need to check for KKK conditions. It's called, I think, Karush Lung. Okay, I might be misspelling it, Karush Lung. Okay, but that's the person who basically came up with this technique. It's called KKT condition. There are five conditions that you need to prove, okay, to check for in order to prove that your solution basically works. Now, out of these five, you will see that three or four of them actually. Is simple. If you already solve this, you already prove the first four. Okay. So first one it says that deviation of uh, your Lagrangian with respect to the op optimal, the original variable, should be equal to zero. It's called the stationarity. Which okay, you know. It, we solved it, we, that means we were able to take a derivation of L with respect to X and it to zero, right? So that means you already have done this. The second and the third, so you have an uh, optimal, the, uh, you have the original variable, which is X. Now you also have alphas and betas, right? The, dual, the, the, the Lagrangian multiplier. They're also called dual variables, okay? So that means that the derivation of 
uh, this term with respect to alpha i to solve for uh, optimal alphas should be equal to here. What's the derivation of Lagrangian with respect to alpha i? It was h i x. We already know h i x what is equal to zero, right? So that means that if you already solved it, you already proved that. This is also proved. The next one is the deviation of this with respect to beta j when you solve for beta. What do you think it should be? Division of Lagrangian with respect to beta j. So this should be less than equal zero because this is equal jjx, which is less than equal zero. So this is called dual uh, primal. Now, the fourth one simply says beta j, any value for beta j that you find should be greater than equal to zero based on the definition of beta j that we say. And that's called dual visibility. Okay. You see these four, this four basically, they are they exist. If you reach to this point, that means you maximize with respect to alpha and beta, then minimize with respect to x. Your solution, in order to be optimal, that means you were able to take a derivation with respect to x, set it to zero. You were able to take a derivation with respect to x alpha y, and that gave you h i x, and that's equal to zero. That means you didn't violate the constraint. With respect to beta g was less than equal to zero. You didn't violate the constraint. And the fourth one says that any value for beta you found, it should be greater than equal to zero based on the definition. Now, the fifth one called um, complementary. Slackness. Now, this is the one that is, is technically <laughs> you are going to use to solve for this problem. You remember we said that term summation of that, you need to go to zero. Okay. So the complementary slackness says that Lagrange for for in, uh, for inequality constraints, Lagrangian multiplier times the constraint should go to zero. So Lagrangian multiplier dj, dj x should be equal to zero or summation of it also doesn't matter. Complementary slackness, remember the, the definition. Lagrangian multiplier times constraint should be equal to zero. We don't write it for the equality because the equality is already zero, h i x is zero. That term is, doesn't make sense, right? However, here, this should go to zero, but if you think about it, there are scenarios that could happen here. What if gjx, gjx is always less than equal to zero, right? What if jjx is less than zero, is not equal to zero? Then what should happen? Zero. bj should go to zero. That means optimal bj equal to because that term should go to zero. If your j's, uh, g's are less than zero, so beta should go to zero. Now, what if the other scenario is that beta j is greater than zero, it's not equal to zero. Equal to then gj should go to zero, which is the definition of it is less than equal to zero, right? So gjx is going to the other scenario is that both of them are zero, basically, right? Which, think about it. It's, it's not going to happen the other way around because the model forced that to go to zero. So it's forcing it by setting one of these two to zero. So this becomes complementary slackness. Does that make sense? And if you think about it, all we have learned so far 
alpha doesn't do anything here because it's always zero. That term is always switched to zero. But this here, you have some betas. Okay. We will see that in the, in the next step. We are going to see that that betas are helping us to solve for support vector machine. Okay. So now, why did we learn this? Because the first algorithm we are going to learn support vector machine. This technique is based on this concept. Now, these conditions are not universal, right? Like they change according to every problem. No, it's complementary slackness is universal. <laughs> complementary slackness, that, that means that they, right now, like we have a minimization problem and we have uh, G of TJ of X is then equal to zero. If that was not the case, then take like, a of X. It always is the case. Zero. Definition of convex set it was equal to zero or less than equal to zero. Yes. Convex set couldn't be if it's greater than equal to zero. I told you by default, majority of time is not convex. So the definition of convex set, it should be equal to zero, less than equal. If it's greater than zero, there is a chance that being a convex set, but you need to prove it. You know, it's not there are some scenarios which we, we will we will see in some example later. But uh, that, that's a universal definition. Now, let's, let's take five minutes break. Let me start this <laughs> Yeah, we're going. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Sir, uh, those who don't have uh, the second love, it's not, uh, cannot find it. The second love, it's not in, uh, like, it's not posted here. Like, there are, I think, asking for the solution that we The solution did we did the last time. For logistics. Logistic the solution. There was someone in the, like, we have to multiply with the multiply. Very negative. What? Multiply very negative. I'm if you guys asking for code, I, I, I only first submitted the code for the first class. You guys are responsible to write your own code. I write it in the class, there's a recording of it. Go type it. <laughs> the fact that I already coded for you, it should be enough. Go watch the video coded. <laughs> No, you guys, go, go take a class with a computer science department. You will understand that the, 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 they don't give you a lab like this. They don't give you oh, any solutions. Like you expect to learn yourself. If, if you always get something, you get used to it. You know, if you don't type, if you don't use those fingers, you become butter fingers. Now that's why. That's why. That's why we thought maybe because it wasn't the first one. We thought no, the first one. The, the, the first one because. Uh, there was an error. Actually, the first one also, I shouldn't have posed because there was the only error was that the zero, the zero in the mean and the standard deviation. So I expect you guys, if you see an error, you go home also try to see that maybe it works. Okay. So this, uh, you know, Cyclotron has these functions that you can generate synthetic data. So make blob is one of those. If you want to create a blob, blob data means, uh, you know, if I want to make a classification, this is a blob data. This is one blob. This is another blob. And you put points in it, right? So that's right. So I want to make a uh, classification. I will call this make blob. And make blob is also make it so simple to classify. There's, there's a huge gap between them. So it's easy classification. X, Y, make blob. Um, it asks you n samples. So we want 10,000 samples. Tells you n features. Let's say two features that sense for the dimension. Like two, this we want two dimension. Um, yes. N cluster. Yeah. Centers. Right. Okay. 
centers. So I want this data to have two centers, those two distributions. And um, random state. Actually, create that that's x and that's y basically if you look at the x basically it will create x as a continuous number that means if we want to do a naive base this is going to be which naive base your features are continuous Gosh. 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 so Let's create a class called Gaussian Naive Base. Um, it has X, it will receive X as an input, and X is uh, non point matrix. It will receive Y, and that is non point array. Define a uh, host. And now it's passed. We will come back to this later. So uh, I want to just first similar to what we did create the content to split the data basically to find Actually, I'm just going to tag this with self here. As soon as I close this function, it will just save it. Yeah. Now I'm calling to that function here. So, the actual name base uh, say that <clears throat> technically the way that Gaussian name base is that each, so the way that for name base doesn't matter, Gaussian speed, the way that you need to solve is that separate the both class data from each other, right? Class zero to class one, separate them. Then you are, because this is Gaussian, that means that each dimension in your data doesn't matter. For, each class you do. For example, dimension one has a Gaussian for class one. For class zero, dimension one also has a Gaussian. You have different Gaussian, because, but it's a Gaussian, right? So, in order to write a function for Gaussian, it's like I have a column. I know the data in it is Gaussian. How should I write that? What does a Gaussian have? Mean a standard deviation variance, right? So if you find that, you can either write this function basically, like right? um, that's a Gaussian equation, right? You can write that, and so this is this, this is not related to this class, but. Hopefully you guys know. If you have a Gaussian distribution, and I give you a point, you need to calculate the probability of that point. What's the function that you will use? One person here. But what, what does that call? The table is correct, but what, there's a term for it. What does it call? Well, no, 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 no
Have you heard the term PDF? Oh, Lean density function. So you first feed a Gaussian, but now I have a Gaussian for a given column. I see a point x1 equal 3.4. I need to see what is the PDF of having this point. You need to also have a PDF function, right? Now, so let's, let's start here. So let's write a function that is job is that if I pass a column to it, finds the Gaussian of that column. So define a uh, fit Gaussian. I, I pass not x data, a column. Okay. Um, this function first need to point what's the mean of that column. You know, mean data. Here you don't need zero because it's just one column. And a standard deviation. Deviation of that column. Now, um, there are two ways because we don't want to spend much time right, right on this. Uh, you can, we are going to use this SQP stat norm. Uh, or type by well, it's good. Uh, so it has a function pre built Gaussian for, for formula for you. You can, I recommend it for practice, write it yourself. If you don't want to write it, call to this class, this function that already has the PDF function also. So the way that you call to that class uh, is um, we will say that the distribution equal norm. Because I already imported right at the beginning, norm of that requires a mean and a standard deviation. But in order to find the Gaussian, all you need is a mean and a standard deviation. If you have it, you have the Gaussian, right? So this function, all it needs, what's the mean? What's the standard deviation? So it already has a Gaussian form for you, right? That already defined the mean it tells you where's the start. Standard deviation says the shape, right? If you have that for any new point, you need to call to that PDF function or the Z table and gives you the probability of that point happening, right? So this function is going to return this distribution to us. Now, so for uh, name phase, okay, we are, let's, let's assume you have found. Uh, all this Gaussian, right? What's the equation of a phase? How do you calculate the probability of point given x? Well, you're like, right? So we are going to write a function of actually this. So prior is simple, like you just look at your data, you already separate that you know the prior. What was the definition of likelihood in name base? What was the main assumption of name base? Independent. Independent. Sure independent. That means the probability of X as a vector being something, even Y equal K, is actually probability of Dimension one being something given y equal k times probability of dimension two being something given y equal k, and so on, right? Multiplication of each value of each column, probability of value of each column times the other one. Now, we want to write a function that says that, um, um, let's see, calculate probability. So there is a function that receives a uh, receives basically your data or function uh, receives um, one data point uh, receives the prior because we need a prior multiplication of prior times. And in this scenario, we have two dimensions, right? Our data has two columns. So a distribution one, a distribution two. Does it make sense so far? So what should this function return? It should return us 
prior times distribution one, but distribution one, we are getting it from that norm function, right? That class already has a function called PDF. Okay, norm dot PDF uh, x dimension zero times distribution two uh, PDF x dimension one. Basically, this term tells you that this x is a one re record, right? You pick first column, first looking at the first column, first value, and says that what is I'm asking to this distribution, what is the chance of having such a value? Times asking the second distribution, what is the chance of getting this value? Multiply all of that together becomes that posterior term. Does it make sense? So they are basically k and x, the prior and the distribution. So that's the prior. This term is this one. And this term is this one. The second one is that one. Distribution one, distribution two. Each dimension has its own distribution. Make sense? Yes? It's, you kind of look confused. Okay. And define uh, all or B, whatever you want to call it. So, no, that's all in the A base has those two functions. It, it's that after that, you basically create that feed function and just load the data to it, basically. So, now, what is the first step? We already split the data into this, right? We want to work with the self dot x train, but you remember I told that separate the data for both class, right? So, let's create x. Um, uh, x zero. Mm, that's it's going to be self dot x train, where self dot y train was equal to zero. That gives me all the points in data train data that uh, belongs to class zero. I'm going to copy the same thing for class one. Change it to one. So now I have most of this separated. Next is that we calculate the prior. So self dot prior, uh, prior zero, prior of class zero. How do we calculate it? How many points is in that class divided by total how many points you have, right? So length of x zero divided by length of self dot x train. That's your first prior. Do the same thing for the second prior. And that's your second prior, right? <laughs> now, the next is the likelihood ones. How many dimension we have? Two. How many class we have? Two. How many combinations we need to find? Basically, we need to find four distributions, right? One distribution per column per class. So we are going to call this self dot distribution x zero zero means column zero of class zero. Okay. And we already know this function. We need to just call to this function, pass the data to it. That gets x zero data. Going to put this four times. So the next one, I all I need to just change the indices basically. No, I need to I need to add the column. You know? So this means all the row and column zero, all the row and column one. All the row, column zero, all the row and column one. Okay. So 
Now I have the distributions also. So now what uh, we find other function to predict. Right, because this function, this call, I'm going to actually call it inside the post in it also. As soon as you pass the data, calculate everything for you. So self dot call. So this predict function, what I, what I want is that as soon as I call it, it goes over the test data and predicts for me the values. Right? You, you guys missing something? Yeah, just set this call or forward. Oh, that's okay. So we will loop over for uh, for sample and target in zip. You guys know what's a zip function? Yeah. Then the term zip like a zipper. So if you have two two lists, you want to loop over the, the list at the same time, pick the first one from the first list and the first one from the second one. Pick the second one from the first and second one from the like uh, corresponding to use a zipper. Basically, it zips the two together. Right? That's exactly where the term comes. So self dot x test and self dot y test. So basically, what it does loops through them. First, the pick from, from first from each, second from each, and it's like that. So now. What I want to do is that, so you remember in generative classification, you shouldn't just calculate one probability and assume one minus the other one. You need to calculate both. That means that for each sample, I need to check what is the probability belonging to class one, what's the probability belonging to class zero, and pick the maximum of those two. And what's the probabilities? You already have a function for it, right? Which multiplies the prior of that class times distribution of a column one of that class and distribution of the column two of that class, which we already calculated those here also, right? So for each sample, probability of class one is, I will call to this function. This function will get the sample and self dot prior one, and self dot distribution. This one and then self dot distribution of x one one. Right. I passed the sample data point to this function. This function as an input was getting the prior distribution of the column one in that class from the training data. Distribution of the col column zero and column one. one. Then the greater, then the maximum. Yeah, so this function, what it does, multiplies the prior times first value, first dimension of this PDF over that times first second value of this PDF over this distribution. There are two Gaussians, right? You pass first column value. This is exactly what we have, right? This is a for one record. Here we have, this is a record as x0 column 1 x1 and we already calculated from the training data a prior for class 1 prior right this prior is like for example 30 percent you multiply this by you look at the flat, uh, column 1 in training data for this class it was a gaussian right that's a gaussian i pass whatever is in it let's say there's a 10 here I will pass this 10 to this Gaussian and says that what is the chance of that 10? That means the PDF value. It gives me the chance. So it gives me like 0 0.003. And I pick this one, go to the second Gaussian, Gaussian over the second dimension from this class. And what's the PDF of that? It gives me another problem. That probability times this probability times this becomes the probability of belonging to class one, right? So copy the same thing for class zero, call it PY zero, and then change the indices. Uh, 
on all of you. So then that be zero one and dark distribution x zero. Okay, this indices, uh, the first one stands for class. The second one stands for uh, dimension. So class zero, dimension zero, class zero, dimension one. So now I will print. Oh. Yes, I was like this uh, probability of Y as one given Let's see. I'm just trying to print it out to it as, as a probability form. So. I will print. Point belongs to the class on and model. Predicted. Are good and done. I picked the arc max of those two, right? That's just a printout, it doesn't change it. I'm just trying to print the result. So now uh, I call this Gaussian, uh, pass the data to it, and why. By default, it should call in the post in it, it will split the data and you call to fit function. Call, sorry, call function. And that means it will calculate the priors and the distributions. And after that, I need to just call to this predict function, basically. This CLF of predict. If you are the max. We will start print, printing out probability of probability of where a point this one probability of being class one given this is the input data this two vector this two dimension was this and probability of belonging to class zero was that the model picks the maximum which is class zero the, the point belongs to class zero and the model predicted zero also. So you see the name base technically doesn't have anything. It's literally it, it just if it's Gaussian Gaussian name base, which is the most difficult one technically. All you need to do is to separate your data with a Gaussian per column, and write a function that multiplies the PDF of the outputs times the prior, and that's that's the name base. Question. Simple. So if you learn the math behind them, I mean, technically it's simple to write this algorithm. Now, okay, you have a lab which will be posted for this. There are two parts in that. One is that 
the, whatever we did right now is called hard coding. Uh, the definition of hard coding means that I wrote this exactly for two dimension, right? What if you have three dimension, ten dimension? You cannot just keep writing this. You need to write some sort of loop to calculate the distributions and multiply the values, right? So you, part of your lab is to basically uh, expand this to a higher dimension, don't hard, hard code it. And the second part is that you need to account for what if your data is discrete. So you need to write another function here in order to calculate the probabilities for discrete. And the way discrete is more simple, right? If you think about it, you need to just count divided by total. That becomes the, uh, the terms that you need to find. Count the frequency of the data set and then just segregate them into classes in discrete. The same thing, separate to two class for each column, you look at all the unique value it has for the training data, calculate the probability of that unique value. NP count divided oh, by length. You get all the data that you want, just tag the data as a cell and call that in the uh, probability function. Okay. Um, Anyone here from Tuesday class? Okay. Uh, you guys just on your Tuesday class, just send me a request now. Do 